Hello everyone, welcome to Rebel Hearts with Christy Reeves. I'm so glad you're joining us again today and we have a wonderful show coming up for you with tons of inspiration, empowerment. I have a wonderful guest I'm gonna present to you in one second. But before I reveal who it is, unless you've seen my Facebook today, I'm gonna tell you about something amazing we have going on. If you watched last week's show, you know that we're doing a wonderful swag bag contest that is going through the months of May and the months of June. And the swag bag contest has a lot of amazing sponsors already attached. Any kind of product that's in the swag bag is eco-conscious, fair trade. Um, the hum companies are all really high vibe, super amazing products. So how will you get that swag bag? What we want you to do is head on over to our podcast. It went live on Monday, the Chris TV Everlots Hearts podcast on iTunes, and leave us a review. You can do that throughout the months of May, throughout the months of June. It goes until the end of June. And every single person who leaves a review will be entered in our swag bag contest. And we have 10 bags to give away. So like I said, head on over to iTunes, Rebel Hearts with Christy Reeves. Leave us a review about the show. Let us know what you like, what you want to hear more about and your name will be entered to win one of those 10 amazing gifts and to say thank you to one of our sponsors for the show I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them the company is go called Golden Ratio Products and Golden Ratio Products are unique masterpieces of form and harmony the glassware and porcelain tableware all designed using the golden ratio principles are like musical compositions in solid form that revitalize water. They use 100% natural materials, no plastics, and all table and glassware is lead free. They are sustainably sourced and completely recyclable. Discover for yourself the amazing difference these products can make in your experience. Just having these golden ratio products in your environment raises the vibratory level of your surroundings, and it also energizes the physical spaces in which they are placed. Even bottled spring water can be energetically dead. Make your water really alive and truly natural with golden ratio products. And Golden Ratio Products is the exclusive importer for the U.S. and Canada of Nature Design's line of glassware. And I've been using the glassware for about six years, and I love them. You can really taste the difference when you pour your water into the glasses, or they have beautiful carafes, or I have my carry-on carry bottles that I take with me. And it really changes the, the vibration of the water. It brings the energy back, it brings the life force back, so it really, really makes a difference. So I highly recommend them, and their products are gonna be part of our swag bag contest. And now it's time to introduce our amazing guest for today's show, Kai Furno. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. Kai Furno is an award-winning international stunt performer, survival expert, TV host, and author. Her athletic ability and fight training helped her land some notable stunt woman jobs, including The Avengers, Thor, X-Men, Pirates of the Caribbean, Hancock, and many, many more. She was named 2012 World Stunt Woman of the Year at the World Tour Stunt Awards, the stunt world's equivalent of an Oscar win. She has participated in Discovery's Everest of survival shows, Naked and Afraid proving that she has the stamina to survive for 21 days with nothing in the deadly Louisiana swamplands. Kai is also a published author with a book titled Superwoman Survival Guide. The book aims to help women confront their fears about the world around them, both in the great outdoors and also in the urban jungle. And she's also a dear friend of mine, and I'm so excited to see her again and have her on the show today. Welcome, Kai. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here, too. I know I haven't seen you in 18 months, and the first time I get to see her is actually here at the studio. This is so amazing. Thank you for being here today. Ah, uh, you're welcome. And I just want to dive in because knowing you and knowing some of your stories, so much about you is really following your dreams, no matter what you are being told, and yeah. overcoming obstacles and challenges, no matter what you were told. And this show is, you know, all about empowering people, following their gifts, following their passions, really going for what is in their heart. So what I would love for you to talk about is because you had a big life change when you were 
19, 20, mm-hmm, right? 19, yeah. You had a car accident. Tell us a little bit what, what happened and what you were actually told around that time. <sighs> well, I was um, driving down a freeway in South Australia in the Adelaide Hills there and um, just going out on a date and the this car passed us and then I don't know the guy that was driving the car decided to have a bit of a race down this freeway and as we were going down this um pretty sharp corner I just remember mm-hmm. saying to him at the time like you know I was saying slow down slow down slow down and he, and, he, and he didn't slow down and then I just remember as we went around the corner I was like fine just drive like that um just don't kill me and then about two seconds later the car went into a spin um and then we headed straight for a big concrete pole um at about mm-hmm. 90k or like 70 mile an hour mm-hmm. um and hit the pole front on and i remember um time sort of slows down you know like you see it in yeah, movies and, yeah. and you see the process in movies but it really does happen like that and as my head was going towards the dash of the car i just um i remember a reader's digest book that i just read two days before mm-hmm. that said head injuries were a really big thing in car accidents. Mm. So I put my my forearm up against my head and my forearm hit the dash instead. But as I hit the dash of the car, um, I heard a a click in my back. Mm. Um, And this article had also addressed uh, broken backs in car accidents. And I realised that that's probably what had happened. And I sort of got a whiplash with the belt, um, with Mm. the seat belt, and it ended up fracturing a bone in my back. Now, my my history, my past, I was a super active kid. You know, I wasn't especially sort of sporty and athletic, but I was always outside. I was riding my horse, you know. I mean, I was playing tennis. I was always very, very active. That was just part of who I was from a very young age. Um, my dad had two daughters and I was the youngest. So <laughs> my sister sort of stayed inside and read books and I was out <laughs> kicking the footy and <laughs> playing with dad. Uh-huh. Um and to go from being very active yeah. to suddenly flat on your back. Um, and I remember staying pretty calm about the whole thing. You know, like when at the, at the time you don't think it will happen to you. Mm. You know, you're just like, oh, I just misheard. It wasn't wasn't yeah, anything yeah. important. Um, but then the doctor came in and he said, you know what, you've broken a bone in your back um, and you've broken it in the best possible place to break your back. <laughs> <laughs> and I do understand that now. You know, I was very mm. lucky there wasn't any nerve damage, mm-hmm. but um, I still didn't really understand what that meant. Yeah. And he sort of laid it out and said, well, you won't ever be able to play sport again. You probably wow. won't be physically active for the rest of your life. You won't be able mm-hmm. to carry a baby to full term. Um, like he really wow. laid some big, heavy life Mm-hmm. sort of limitations on mm-hmm. me in that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, that must have been so heartbreaking for you to going from being such an active person to being told you will never a- be able to do that again, right? Yeah, or, and, I, and I really, I, I remember the moment so vividly. Yeah. Um, I'm writing my second book actually and I had to just relive it the other day to oh write this section and I remember where mum and dad were standing and I remember where the doctor was standing and what he looked like. And I just remember, it w- again, it was like out of a movie, perhaps one tear just went down one side of my face. And as I thought, like, what an, what an awful life that mm-hmm. sounds. Mm-hmm. But then when the tear, by the time it had gotten down, I think I'd already thought, nah, like, mm-hmm. no, that's, that's mm-hmm. not the way I want to live the rest of my mm-hmm. life. Um, so... You know, even even then, I was sort of thinking a ways around the lim- yeah. the limitations that this yeah. doctor was was yeah. putting on me. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a really hard thing to hear. Mm-hmm. But my dad always said that, like, any time anyone told me no, even from when I was like <laughs> really young, <laughs> just like stick her on chin and <laughs> watch me. <laughs> yeah. I will do it be- <laughs> yeah. because he said no. I will do it even more. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost a guarantee. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't listen to his limitations. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm not saying don't listen to your doctor. They are, mm-hmm. you know, they are medical profession professionals mm-hmm. for a reason. They've done mm-hmm. a lot of study. But listen to yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, like I looked at at my body and how it was responding to the healing. And I mean, I was flat on my back for like three months. Um, mm-hmm. I was in hospital for like three weeks and in a big back brace mm-hmm. and it was it was very limiting. Yeah. Um, mum and dad were fantastic. They 
you know, didn't let me watch too much TV mm. and just encouraged me to keep busy while I was mm -hmm. lying on my back. But I listened to what my body said and I really learned the difference between good pain and bad pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that was probably key. Yeah. You know, like a lot of people stop when they feel pain. Yeah. Um, but there's good pain. Yeah, tell us about good pain and bad, bad pain because I know you're right, you wrote in your book about it too. Yeah. So tell us what's the difference. Well, good pain is when you've gone to the gym and you've worked really hard and your muscles ache. Mm -hmm. They ache because your body's changing. They mm -hmm. ache because you've done something good for your body. You're mm -hmm. getting fitter. You're getting stronger. You're getting more mm -hmm. powerful. You know, mm -hmm. so your muscles ache. Yeah. And that is a good pain. Mm -hmm. You know, but some people think, right, I'm going to work out. And they've never worked out in their life. And they head to the gym and they hit it hard and then they can't move the next day. And they're like, wow, that hurts. Yeah. You know, that must be bad for me because that really, that's <laughs> oh, painful. Yeah. And then they never do it again. Yeah. And I love that pain. When I come to from the gym or I take my dances, I just went recently back to dance. I'm like, oh, I feel so good. Right. My whole body, I can feel my muscles. Yeah, you've got to learn to, to appreciate yeah. the good pain, you know. Yeah. And then there's the bad pain. And and. The way I look at bad pain for me is it's a sharp pain mm -hmm. and it's usually like a, a like a really mm -hmm. like it's sharp mm -hmm. and that's sort of how I distinguish it. But then yeah. I also watch what happens with my body for the next mm -hmm. week. A good pain two or three days later and you don't feel it anymore. Mm -hmm. A bad pain, you know, can carry on and become chronic and all that yeah. sort of thing. So you just sort of whatever does, you know, whatever mm -hmm. makes it a bad pain, you yeah. sort of walk away from and whatever yeah. is a good pain, you know, you're growing from. Yeah. And the bad pain also as a warning signal of the body saying, I need a rest or you can't do it or you can't do it at the moment, like honoring yes. your body when it's a bad pain. And I like that you said at the moment because like mm -hmm. I'm recovering from an injury at the moment mm -hmm. and it's fairly limiting and there's bits there's there's things where it is sharp pain and mm -hmm. I back off but mm -hmm. then I try it a week later yeah. and it's not that sharp pain mm -hmm. anymore so you do need to constantly test and push yeah. the boundaries yeah. as you're healing as well mm -hmm. um and a lot of it's just having a good mental attitude yes like there's nothing that will delay healing more than depression mm -hmm. so and there's nothing that depresses you more than doing nothing yeah so I I hooked a rug you know <laughs> <laughs> I painted trees you know uh -huh. like anything my mum would I can't look at poppies the same since my mum would bring in closed poppies mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know but you they actually when they open they open and you can watch them open so it sounds like you're sitting there watching grass grow <laughs> but I would like I get excited about trying to figure out what color the poppy was going to be mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so anything that you can distract yourself mm -hmm. from being inactive will mm -hmm. also sort of encourage mm -hmm. you to be more positive about yeah. your healing yeah and I, w I want to circle back to what you said and also how you overcame that that challenge because I see so many people being told no matter if, it, you know, in general, I'm not even talking about physical limitations, yeah. being told, oh, you can't do this or this is how it's going to go for you. This is what your body is capable of doing or, you, you know, so many people are like, you will live with this illness forever. And yeah. to be told something like that and go, watch me. Yeah. It's just like so brilliant. And I wonder if you have any other advice for our listeners or anything that you personally did where you went, you know what, I'm going to stay positive about this. I know that there are ways of going back and healing this. What helped you to overcome this challenge of being told? Um, no. Well, there was quite a few things I did. Like, And, you know, the first one was stay positive, you mm -hmm. know, like – Look, celebrate the small things mm -hmm. you know like if you wake up in the morning and you can walk up one flight of stairs and you couldn't do it yesterday celebrate it don't yeah. don't think about it and go man I can only do one flight of stairs go well, you know what yesterday I couldn't even do that mm -hmm. you know like that's a, a really important thing and and find your tribe of people mm -hmm. to support you too because there's going to yeah. be days where it really sucks for you you know like and you can't be your own cheerleader mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to have surround yourself with even if it's just another one or two people like as I said, my mum and dad, you yeah. know, like they're the yeah. people that when I'm like, I don't know if I can do this today, mum, she's like, you can do it. I believe in you, you know. So mm -hmm. that's sort of another way. And then as we spoke about testing, like test your limits, um, I have never <laughs> found my limits, I don't think. <laughs> well, I mean, I used to be able to say that till I tore my hamstring off. <laughs> 
prior to tearing my hamstring off. <laughs> but I believe, I bet you, you still wouldn't go and set yourself any limits, even with a torn hamstring. <laughs> right. Well, as I was tearing my hamstring off, I worked for four months during yeah. that process. So I didn't see that as a limit. But, oh. um, you know, I sat in a swamp on Naked and Afraid for 21 days and mm. slowly died. And, you, you know, never once did I get mm. to a stage where I'm like, I can't do this. So yeah. I think um, we are our our biggest limiters, Mm -hmm. you know, like listening to the dissenters, listening Mm -hmm. to the people that say you can't do it Mm -hmm. is is the worst possible thing you can do because you will find a hundred people to tell you that you can't do it for Mm -hmm. whatever reason Mm -hmm. and it has probably nothing to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not – they don't know you, they don't know what you can achieve, you know, so don't listen to the people Mm -hmm. that tell you you can't either. I love that. You know yourself best, right? You absolutely yeah. do, you know. And mm-hmm. I think our biggest problem in life is we listen to other people mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. let other people set our limits. Mm-hmm. Like one of my mottos is um, choose your life and lose your limits, mm-hmm. you know. So it is a it is a choice. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. choose to listen to the people that say you can't do that or mm-hmm. you're never going to be good enough or mm-hmm. you can give it a go yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like. Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, yeah. like he has this quote saying, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't hit, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. I never, ever, ever see failure as um, as trying. Mm-hmm. You know, if I try and I don't succeed, that's not failure for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. A friend of mine once said to me, he said, you can never fail. You can only stop trying. Right. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. I love that. And there's another story because before the accident, you were studying business, right? Yes. And then afterwards, you went on this whole journey to eventually moving into stunts. And even then you were told, oh, you're too old to start with stunts. Yes. So I have a Bachelor of Business Management. Um, My parents, I was very fortunate. They sacrificed a lot and weren't wealthy, but sacrificed a lot to send me to a private school. Mm -hmm. And my dad loves to joke about the fact that a private school education will end up with you falling downstairs for a living. Um, (laughs) I'm not sure if he thinks the sacrifice was worth it. (laughs) But I did get him a cool jacket from Catwoman, so what can I say? (laughs) Here you go, Dad. Yeah, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. So Mm -hmm. my mum sort of said, well, how about a marketing manager for a tourism company? And I thought that sounded like pretty fun. You know, I could Mm -hmm. travel and... And market and be creative and stuff. But so I was doing a Bachelor of Business at the time of the accident and I finished it. Um, mm-hmm. I did my last exams flat on my back with like a, a desk Whoa. propped over me, that special desk we'd bought. Um, and I finished it and decided I never, ever wanted to be indoors again. Mm-hmm. I never wanted to be an active. And so one of my first work projects I did was for an outdoor company mm-hmm. that specialised in team building and leadership programs. Mm. Um, and I became a rock climbing instructor. Yeah. So from being told I would never be active again, <laughs> I went out into the mountains and, and learned how to Love rock it. climb. Um, and rappel or abseil as we call it in Mm -hmm. Australia and Mm -hmm. kayak and sail and I did all Mm -hmm. these amazing active outdoor things um pursuits and I taught them to people I just loved sharing the outdoors with people but Mm -hmm. um it got so busy that I I probably slept inside (laughs) for like 10 days a year (laughs) so I was on a on a school camp and I was tumbling down some sand dunes I'd made Uh up like a gladiator game and these and this kid just turned to me and he's like you know what, you should be a stunt woman. Wow. Have you, had you ever thought about that before? Never. Like, Never. I didn't even know it was a career. <laughs> like, I, I barely watched television. And so it never even struck me that, like, mm. and I know that sounds naive at, like, 23, mm. 24 to not even know <laughs> that stunt people existed. I don't know. And oh, um, I was doing all that on television. We only yeah. had two channels in Australia. Here what you can go. I say? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so... Uh, my sister was living in Vancouver at the time Mm -hmm. and I thought I'd go and visit her and suddenly there were all these productions happening Mm -hmm. in Vancouver and so I thought why not Mm -hmm. you know but I had no clue Mm -hmm. no clue like Mm -hmm. as I said I didn't even know the career existed (laughs) so but how amazing that you just went there and 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 gave it a shot and looked it's like what is this about yeah and then my sister left so she was only there for a little while and there was just me knowing nobody Uh and I bought a van And I lived in a climbing community down by the river (laughs) in my van. And I just um, 
wandered around mm. and told anybody that would talk to me that I wanted mm. to be a stunt performer. Okay. And, um, you know, people laughed or people went, okay, or people thought maybe mm. it could happen. But eventually someone pointed out a guy at a bar and said, you know what, that guy's a stunt performer. If you buy him a drink, I bet he'll tell you how to become a stunt wow. performer. And... Um, <laughs> I know. I love how this universe works. It's so amazing. Right? I know. And I mean, <laughs> God, I was like huge too. Like I was like an Amazon woman because I just climbed and I was chock full of <laughs> muscles and they're in my like dirty climbing clothes. Like, hey, I'm sure he just looked at me and thought, well, free beer would be nice. <laughs> but everything he told me, I wrote it down. Uh-huh. And I always say, like, it's cliche, but mm-hmm. if you're climbing Everest, you have to take it one step at a time. I love that. So everything he told me to do, I did. I mm. found a way to do it. Mm-hmm. I chopped wood to pay for my headshots. Mm-hmm. My wow. first headshots, I didn't even have hair or makeup done. <laughs> <laughs> Just me like, but you got a headshot. <laughs> <laughs> standing there. <laughs> back on it now it was awesome you know it's so oh hilarious God. and I remember I had my first audition in Vancouver for a musical Peter Pan I didn't even have a headshot when I walked in <laughs> I had like this really super long resume because I didn't even know how to write a resume I'm like here's me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and like bless the people that don't laugh you out the room right yeah. you know like honestly Like, people come to me so unprepared and Uh I will never laugh at them. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, okay, well, here's what you have to do. (laughs) And hope that I'm that guy in the bar, Mm -hmm. you know. And and actually, one of the phone numbers he gave me um, was a guy called Kirk Jakes. Mm -hmm. And he became my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I actually was cleaning out my storage locker the other day and I found that piece of paper from like 20 years ago with that phone number written on from that moment. And I was just like, holy cow, like if you just look at Mm -hmm. direction changes and -hmm. and if I Mm -hmm. hadn't called that number, Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, Kirk Jakes was a incredible martial artist. And this is where the no's come in. Mm -hmm. So he ran a place called The Action Room and he Mm -hmm. trained people how to stunt fight. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was a black belt in kickboxing and taekwondo Mm -hmm. and weapons and everything Mm -hmm. like that. And so he's like, yeah, come along. I have classes like twice a Mm -hmm. week. And Mm -hmm. so I drove with my van from (laughs) my river to to the the facility Mm -hmm. and I didn't even have sneakers. Um, I wore my lightest hiking boots <laughs> and my lightest hiking pants and pulled my van up next to these beautiful expensive cars mm-hmm. in the parking lot and mm-hmm. um, walked in and everyone was wearing like Lulus and uh-huh. Nikes and looking beautiful yeah. and I was like right. <laughs> right from the van into the yeah. room. <laughs> and I realised that, um, I mean I probably didn't realise but I was told very, very quickly I was too old. Mm-hmm. To become a stunt performer. Because you were how old at that time? Um, probably 26, 27. Yeah. Um, but the problem was I had no transferable skills. Mm-hmm. So I thought I was just going to repel and kayak stunt mm-hmm. thing and get mm-hmm. into it that way. Yeah. Um, but basically at that stage, I either came in from fighting or gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And there was no way at 27 I was going to be an Olympic level gymnast mm-hmm. off the top of my mm-hmm. hat. So um, <laughs> I trained fighting Mm -hmm. and from that moment on every day Kirk would train with me Mm -hmm. um I trained with him until my money ran out Mm -hmm. and then he trained me for free wow so he trained me for free for three years and I trained almost every day in fighting and weapons wow um but the whole time you know people were like you don't have transferable skills no one will hire you like I was chock full of muscle you know like actresses don't want you to double them if you look like a man Mm -hmm. you know especially from behind so Mm -hmm. um I just had and and I'm too old you Mm -hmm. know people sort of were saying you're sort of getting to the end of your stunt career at that Mm -hmm. age so um you know lots of things going against me but every time someone told me why I couldn't work I showed them I could that's amazing I love that yeah and you know I as you said in the in the speech at the beginning, I ended up winning like the Oscar of stunts. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't, we're not um, recognised at the Oscars. Mm-hmm. We're sort of one of the only departments that's mm-hmm. not, um, which is crazy because yeah. 
stunt people are so important in bringing their production together. But SAG is finally, SAG after is finally recognizing stunt performers. They recognize teams or the coordinator or something. Yeah, Yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we have our Taurus World Mm -hmm. Stunt Awards and Mm -hmm. it's voted on by everyone around the world, all the stunt Mm -hmm. performers around the world. It's the biggest honor that you can get as a stunt performer. And in 2012, I won the award for my work I did on Thor. Mm -hmm. And I just remember just just standing out there like even when I was nominated I didn't Mm -hmm. believe I would win Mm -hmm. you know and I never dreamed that big yeah you know like when I dreamt the biggest dream I could possibly dream it was just to be able to work as a stunt performer Mm -hmm. you know so to then yeah to do that Mm -hmm. was just yeah yeah, That's such a, amazing. And then I just look back and I'm like, all right, doctor. So <laughs> let me just tell you. <laughs> you think I couldn't be active and I chose the most brutal physical yeah. career I could do. And I showed you. <laughs> such a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> and I love like I love this is called Rebel Hearts because the thing for me is as you're living this life, mm-hmm. you don't feel like a rebel. Mm-mm. You know, like when people say to me, oh, my gosh, you just went against everything that people yeah. told you. I'm like, did I? Yeah. Like you yeah. don't feel like you're rebelling. You're just living it. But yeah. And you're following. It feels like when I listen to your journey, it was never, okay, this is my big picture goal. It was kind of like following your heart one step at a time. Yeah, and absolutely. And also listening to your heart, being all of a sudden led to the right place, such mm-hmm. as Vancouver, being led to the right people, the person in the bar, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. talking to you. Yeah. And that and phone number and yeah. just everything. Yeah. And the the interesting thing for me was um so going right back to the car accident Mm -hmm. when the car accident happened um the guy that was driving the car was extremely worried about his car and not so worried about me oh Uh, it was the last date Mm -hmm. um and (laughs) out of nowhere like out of Uh the crowd this person just like everyone was screaming because there was gas Mm -hmm. going everywhere and get out of the car get out of the car and i'm like just don't move me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've done something to my back. And mm-hmm. out of nowhere, this guy just walks out of the crowd mm-hmm. and kneels down next to me. And he just takes my hand and he's like, hey, you know, what's your name? And I'm like, oh, Chloe. And he's mm-hmm. like, what, are you, what were you doing tonight? Mm-hmm. I said, oh, we're just going down to see a movie. And um, and he just chatted to me. Mm-hmm. like, And amidst all the craziness, mm-hmm. he just made this bubble of protection for me yeah, amongst everything. Yeah. And then the ambulance came and he, you know, and I sort of looked to the ambulance. And then when I looked back, he wasn't there anymore. Mm. And I was like, I could never thank that guy. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even know if he was from this planet. <laughs> I don't even know <laughs> if he was from this world. I don't know. But I can never thank yeah. that guy. I didn't get to. Mm-hmm. And then so we're I, thanking him now. Right. So yeah. I... I pass it forward, yeah. you know, and then Kirk yeah. Jake's working with me tirelessly for three years to make mm-hmm. my dream come true in his time mm-hmm. too. You know, like I can't thank Kirk enough. Mm-hmm. Like I do thank him often, but it doesn't, yeah. I can't do anything for him that means as much to him mm-hmm. as that meant to me. So like anytime anyone asks for my help, I mm-hmm. just, I give it to them, as yeah. you know, to the best yeah. of my ability yeah. and capability, you yeah. know, because I've just had so much help on my way too. Mm. I love that. Mm. I love that. And I wanna wanna switch gears a little bit because for me what you're doing is kind of like or when you right now I know you're on hiatus <laughs> from doing stunts. <laughs> yeah. Hiatus. But I like that term. Hiatus, for it. <laughs> yeah. We'll just call it that. <laughs> but when you were going out on the set every single day as a stunt performer, you have to conquer, you have to overcome your fears. And I right. feel it's such an analogy also for our life when fear shows up. Yeah. To show up no matter how big the fear is, no matter if it's, you know, you're following your dream and all of a sudden all this fear comes up and you're being paralyzed and you're yeah. like, OK, and I can't do this. I can't do this. Or so many people I see, they have a possibility and opportunity showing up and they're being paralyzed by fear. Yeah. So they cannot grasp it. And for me, being a stunt performer and doing what you have been doing for so many years or what you did for so many years, mm. it's kind of overcoming your fear every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Like what a lot of people don't realize is um, stunts is risky. Mm-hmm. You know, like they get the idea of it, mm-hmm. but every day I go to set is a day I could either be injured or die. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. because otherwise the actors would be doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, there is enough risk involved that there is a possible injury that could occur. Mm-hmm. Um, so your body has this incredible mechanism called fight or flight. Yeah. When you put it in a situation that is anti your survival. Mm-hmm. And so everybody gets it. Mm-hmm. And so I deal with this fear mechanism every single day because fear is not useful in our day and age that much. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in a survival situation, mm-hmm. fear is extremely useful because it can stop you from making really stupid decisions, yeah. you know, like it can give you that extra adrenaline to run away from the saber-toothed tiger or whatever. But mm-hmm. when you are <laughs> when you yeah. are in um, you know, in our everyday life, fear isn't mm-hmm. that helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of treat it like that little, that movie with the emotions. What was that called? Um, you know, know that cartoon one? Inside Out. Inside, Inside out. out. Because that's what it is. Fear mm-hmm. is a voice in your head. Mm-hmm. And so what you learn to do as a stunt performer is you learn to put that character somewhere else. Because yeah. if I step into a stunt and I'm not 100% sure mm-hmm. that I'm going to be successful with it, mm-hmm. then I'm probably not. Mm-hmm. You know, so every time I do something, I have to commit to it 100%. Yeah. And fear doesn't allow 100% mm-hmm. commitment. Fear mm-hmm. is the thing that will keep one foot in and one foot out. Mm-hmm. And that's with everything. Yeah. I um, I have a tattoo and it says, um, I'm not afraid I was born to do this. <laughs> and everyone that. thinks that it's for stunts, but it's actually when I <laughs> sold my first book, I had to do a public speaking circuit. <laughs> And I was, like, terrified. I was like, get up in front of people and talk to them. (laughs) Like, terrified. So, um, but one way of conquering fears is repetition, of doing the thing that makes you Mm -hmm. afraid until Mm -hmm. you're not afraid of it anymore. And so now I'm quite okay with getting up and (laughs) speaking. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I just... I listen to what the voice is saying Mm -hmm. because obviously I'm standing on the edge of a rooftop and the voice is going, don't jump off, whatever you do. (laughs) That would be stupid. Like if you jump, what Mm -hmm. if the wires don't hold you? What if the airbag collapses? Mm -hmm. And you just go, well, I've committed to this. Mm -hmm. I've told them I can do this job. This isn't going to be helpful now. Mm -hmm. And I just put it away. And the last thing I say before the director yells action because they do the three, two, one, so at Mm -hmm. about two, I'm like, I can do this. Mm. And I breathe out Mm -hmm. and I just commit. Yeah. You know, and I find that helps me Mm -hmm. when I'm about to walk on stage for public speaking. I can do this. This is, you know, I've prepared. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm good at my job. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. And I love how you talk about commitment. Mm. How to overcome fear by just committing yeah. to what and, and showing up and committing to what you're doing right. instead of questioning. I mean, for whatever reason you have that, that dream or the desire or for whatever reason you're doing a book tour promoting your book or mm. jumping over of a house, of a building. Yeah. And to commit to that as a way to overcome your fear. I think that is just like so, so brilliant and so beautiful. And I feel like Nike did us all a disservice by having like just do it as that logo. <laughs> because because now we're going to rewrite seems, the slogan now. Now it seems really cheesy, <laughs> but that is it. Like yeah. just do it. Yeah. You know, like so many people talk to me about their dreams and why mm-hmm. they haven't come true, mm-hmm. and the only reason they haven't come true is they didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Like just do it. Yeah. You know what? I I didn't know stunts would hurt. Mm-hmm. Naive, I know. <laughs> I first time I got punched in the face, I went to the bathroom and cried, and I was like, <laughs> "Like this is not fun." <laughs> but so my dream didn't look exactly like I thought it would look. Mm-hmm. So I changed the goal, the dream. I changed mm-hmm. how I went about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't fail because I went to the bathroom and cried. I mm-hmm. just learnt better ways of dealing yeah. with it. Yeah. So. You know, that's the thing is some people put the toe in the water and then it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, God. But if it doesn't work, try mm-hmm. some other way of doing mm-hmm. it. There's about a million different ways of achieving yeah. your dreams yeah. and goals. I love that. I love that. It's kind of like the recalibration. Okay, this is where I am mm-hmm. and this one doesn't work. Let's mm. try something different. Let's take a different route. Let's take a different approach. Or yeah. even when you talked about staying positive, let's have, let's have that positive attitude yeah. and and look at what's working and, 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 and be excited about it 
Absolutely. I listened to a really brilliant podcast with Glennon Doyle. And she, and it's so beautiful because she said it's when because she has a has a blog that has millions of readers right now. She's a published author. She has a big following, and she was asked. I think Elizabeth Gilbert did the interview with her, and she was asked, "What are you doing different now than you did way back when? Yeah. Or what? Or how are you approaching?" She's like, "I'm approaching it the same way. I'm approaching it with a sense of gratitude, and I'm and it's also from a place of service. Mm-hmm. I'm showing up for one million people the same way I showed up for ten. Yeah. I'm committed to one million people." the way I committed to 10. Yeah. So it's that commitment and showing up and looking at, you know what, if I can serve 10 people, I have served yeah. 10 people. I have inspired 10 people today. Yeah, absolutely. And not looking at, okay, I can only walk one flight of stairs or, you know, this, this route isn't working and everything is horrible and maybe it's a sign that I shouldn't go that path. Yeah. But as seeing it as a calibration of, okay, how can I serve? Yeah. And looking at it, okay, maybe the universe doesn't want me to go that way. Mm. Maybe there's a much easier, a better way for me to go about it. Definitely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's about being adaptable. Like mm-hmm. in, in my book, I talk about four attitudes of survival and they're mm-hmm. be positive, be prepared, be adaptable and educate yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think they're not just attitudes of survival. They're attitudes that will help you Absolutely. in life. And, yeah. um, I don't know, there's this quote from somebody, some esteemed doctor, Mm -hmm. that says, you know, you don't have to change because survival is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically saying, you can keep doing what you're doing, but you're probably going to die. You know, Uh so I kind of, I kind of love that thing. It's like, I just, I did this stunt and I look on it and I cringe. It was early Mm -hmm. in my career Mm -hmm. and I just thought there was only one way to do it. And I had to like stand up on a table and trip and like hit my legs on the edge of the table and do like a legs overhead flip and land Mm -hmm. on my back. It was Mm -hmm. a comedy. And the problem was that the length, the height of the table off the ground was shorter than my torso. Ah. So I'd hit my legs, flip over and crack my head on the concrete. Oh my God. And it was concrete, it wasn't a pad. And I was like, crack. And the first time I did it, I was like, oh, my goodness. And I got back up and I'm like, we need another take. And I was new. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, and no one noticed. And I was like, oh, shoot, I did that wrong. And Uh and I did it like five more times doing it the same way. Hitting your head every single time. Hitting my head every single time. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I was not senseless. senseless. I couldn't barely remember my name. Like it was Mm -hmm. really severe concussion. And I was like. Okay, because I was too scared to sort of say, mm-hmm. no, mm-hmm. I need to find a different mm-hmm. way of doing it. I need to stop, you know, yeah. like, yeah. but, there, and I, I see that's a good analogy for life sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, like I literally banged my head against the brick wall. Until yeah. <laughs> so I realized that was not yeah. the way I should have been doing it. Yeah. You know, um, so it's a big, there's a difference between giving up and, mm-hmm. and choosing a different way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I love that. And then what I also saw, you know, the analogy, I want to bring up another analogy because you have that outdoor experience. You even survived in the jungle out there for 21 days. Yeah. And what what I love about it, and I think you wrote about it in your book too, to actually, when we are in these situations, there's like no, I don't know, like we don't have a have a like a checklist. Like if you're in the in the jungle outdoors, this is what you do. Check it off, right? right. It's so much about following your intuition. Yeah. It's following your intuition to find the food or find the water mm-hmm. and, and be in that energy of how do I move forward? Yeah. Has that ha, how have all these outdoor experiences that you have had and also done the show like Naked and Afraid, how has it helped you strengthen your own intuition? Or was it all, or did you, have you always had that? Um, see, that was the interesting thing for me was I wrote the book before I did Naked and Afraid mm-hmm. and people sort of think I did it the other way around mm-hmm. because the book came out after Naked and Afraid. But um, I think I, I sat there a lot on mm-hmm. Naked and Afraid and one of the things I learned that I was really happy with about myself Mm -hmm. was that the way I deal with life when I'm under the most stress I could possibly be in Mm -hmm. and the way I deal with life when Mm -hmm. I'm really, really comfortable Mm -hmm. is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've always tried to trust my instincts and intuition. Like even Mm -hmm. when I was 18 and I was backpacking around the Mm -hmm. world, I'd actually flip a coin to decide whether to go left (laughs) or right. So (laughs) I'm not sure if... You know, I'm not sure if it was just something that I always felt or had mm. or 
got rewarded for. Mm. You know, I backpacked in over 52 countries, a lot of it wow. by myself, and I never had a bad thing happen, mm. never got robbed, never, mm-hmm. you know, I had some real close calls. But so a lot of it is, a lot of it's instinct, a lot mm-hmm. of it's preparation, and mm-hmm. a lot of it's just trusting. If mm-hmm. if your drink's fizzing, don't drink it, you know. Yeah. I didn't order the fizzy drink. <laughs> it's like, like that's where yeah. a lot of people um, – a lot of people fall down. Yeah. Is they hear the voice in their gut, I think mm-hmm. I would say more, mm-hmm. and they override it mm-hmm. because they think yeah. they're being silly. Yeah. They think, you know, like um, women these days, you know, probably more than ever want to feel like it's okay to walk to the car in the dark by themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's just not. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're not proving anything to anybody mm-hmm. if you walk to your car and get mugged. Yeah. You know, yeah. all you're proving is that you were too silly to ask for help. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. those sort of things, like if yeah. you are nervous about it, it's not, there's nothing yeah. wrong with asking yeah. for help. Guy, yeah. girl, anything, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. just trust it. Yeah. And that brings us back to to what you said at the very beginning. It's so many times we've been programmed or imprinted from the outset or we're following other people's expectations instead of listening to that own inner voice yeah. and cultivating that because that is what's ultimately bringing us to where we need to go. Mm-hmm. I believe that's probably brought you to that bar that one particular <laughs> night <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and got you to the right people. It's, yeah. it's really cultivating that. And, you know, yes, listening to advice but then deciding for us, ourselves, is that advice right or not? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that is a big thing because if I took the advice of the guy that said I was too old, mm-hmm. then I would have stopped. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's the doctor's mm-hmm. thing. If mm-hmm. I took his advice, I would have stopped. Yeah. And part of part of the reason I do motivational speaking is because um, I've met people mm-hmm. who listened to the doctor mm-hmm. and they spent their whole lives limiting what they could and couldn't do mm-hmm. based on what a doctor mm-hmm. told them. And they say to me, like, I had, this, I had the same thing as you did, wow. you know, and, and I've done nothing, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, and I've got so much pain because part of the pain is if you stop yourself, your muscles degenerate mm-hmm. and your mm-hmm. body doesn't mm-hmm. know how to adjust to that and then you do mm-hmm. end up in a lot of pain yeah. you know the best thing is to keep moving a lot of the time when mm-hmm. when that happens mm-hmm. um so i i liked what you said before about you know the lady who said if she can t- reach 10 people or mm-hmm. one person or 500 people because mm-hmm. um a thing that's a constant self-doubt for me is why people would want to listen to my story, mm-hmm. you know, like because when you're living it, it doesn't feel like anything. Yeah, you know, it feels like, you know, I was in <laughs> in Australia last week and I'm driving down a road and and like in this small town in the middle of nowhere and I, and I thought, shoot, you know, like I've been on movie sets with like Hugh Jackman and Chris Hemsworth and it just seems like <laughs> it seems like it seems like another world and another person's mm-hmm. story or a dream mm-hmm. or a memory, you know. Yeah. So when I'm standing up there and I'm trying to talk. To people, mm-hmm. the hardest thing for me is wondering why they would want to listen. Mm. Um, you know, like especially corporate groups, you know, yeah. and, and I'm just like, what, what have I got mm-hmm. that this person's going to learn from? Mm-hmm. And then I just have to say it doesn't matter. You know, like if one person walks away from this having mm-hmm. heard something that resonates mm-hmm. with them, mm-hmm. I've changed the world in some way. Yeah, You know, it only takes one person or – you know to make a difference so yeah. it is it is something that I struggle with but I appreciate mm. what yeah what that lady said and I love that I love that if you can change the life of one person because sometimes we have this idea that what we have to do has to be so big and so outrageous in order to f- for it to be worthwhile or worthy or become mm-hmm. regarded as something important mm-hmm. and sometimes it's just like this one tiny thing that we can do yeah. that touches just one person and it might be something you know you go to the supermarket and the grocery the store the person at the checkout has a bad day and you just say how are you yeah absolutely yeah i remember coming from bali and i went through passport check in la yeah. And the immigration officer looked so sad, and I said to him, how are you today? And he said, looked at me, and he said, 
I've been sitting here for 13 hours. You're the first person who's actually asking me how I'm doing. Mm. You totally just made my day. I'm like, all I did is ask you, how are you doing? He's yeah. like, yeah, that made my day because in 13 hours, no one cared. Yeah. And it's just like that teeny tiny thing that we can yeah. do just asking someone, how are you? It's, a, it's that amazing. That makes all the difference, yeah. You know, because it always... Like one thing that annoys me is people like, well, I can't make a difference, so I'm not mm-hmm. going to try. Yeah. You know, like recycling. You know, if you put one can in a mm-hmm. recycling bin that you didn't put in the garbage bin, you've mm-hmm. changed the world. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. don't don't think you need to make big contributions. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. every little bit that yeah. moves us forward in a positive mm-hmm. way has yeah. has changed the world for the better. Yeah, I love that. Mm. So that's sort of. Mm-hmm. And what I think anyway. So you mm-hmm. can. Little things mm-hmm. can make a huge difference. Yeah. I love that. And what are you up to next, Kai? What's coming up for you? Well, what I can you share? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you said, I've taken a brief hiatus from stunts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May well be an extended hiatus. So uh-huh. I've, I've done 15 years. I've achieved everything I've, I've mm-hmm. really wanted to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my goal was to double a superhero and be the sole double for a big action movie. And I was mm. that with uh, Lady Warrior Goddess Sif on Thor. Um, mm, I love that show. Such a cool I role to play. It, yeah. You know, and then winning the award. Um, I'm writing my second book, which mm-hmm. is sort of a, an expose of behind the stunt industry, mm-hmm. but with a woman in a man's world sort of perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, every career I've ever chosen has been in a man's world. So just Mm -hmm. sort of looking at how you get through that in in a beautiful, positive way. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm back in LA and talking to some people about some TV shows. So Mm -hmm. I'm super excited about that. That would be me in front of the camera as me. (laughs) (laughs) Which is, you know, I I love that. I love being Mm -hmm. me. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a few acting roles in my stunt career and I wasn't so good at saying other people's lines, but I'm definitely (laughs) definitely okay being me in front of camera. So that's That's the goal is to try and Mm -hmm. see if I can influence the Mm -hmm. 400, the 4,000, you know, just, just to help. Mm-hmm. as much as I can move yeah. people forward in a positive way. I love that. That is incredible. Thank you. And where can our audience find you? If they want to get in touch with you, know what's up, what you're up to and what's happening in Kai's life. <laughs> well, I have a website, www.kaifreneau.com. Um, Freno is spelled F-U-R-N-E-A-U-X and mm-hmm. Kai is just K-Y, very simple. Um, so you can catch me on the website. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Please, if you have any questions, you want any help, you have just want to chat to someone for a second. You know, I'm mm-hmm. always open to writing back to, mm-hmm. to helping people out and, mm-hmm. and helping you move forward. So um, feel free to find me, message me, have a chat. Thank I'm around. You. Thank you. I am so excited you are on the show today. My goodness. I, I'm so inspired right now, and I hope our audience is inspired too. <laughs> I can't believe I've inspired one of the most inspiring people there is. <laughs> well, thank you. We inspire each other. Oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so, so much for all the inspiration, all the empowerment, and I hope a lot of people are feeling as inspired as I'm feeling right now after speaking with you for the past 50 minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And we will be back next Wednesday with more inspiration. And just remember, Swag Back Contest, head on over to iTunes, to our podcast, leave a review. Kai's interview should be up in a couple of days. It usually takes us a couple of days to put up the interview. So to give us some review on her interview as well. And we'll see you next week.